Before solving the Maxwell equations in free space in the differential form, which I'll do in the next chapter, I would like to show you how to arrive at the wave equation for the electric field in free space using the integral form and leave you as an exercise work with a magnetic field. So here are the Maxwell equations in free space. Remember free space means no charge and no current where we are in space. So Q is zero and the I is zero. Remember though that you can have charge and current far away. In fact, that is okay as long as where we are, there are no charges in current. And we're going to show you that then magnetic and electric field changes can pass through this space. And we'll be showing you that. Uh, so we have two equations that are zero and two have the fluxes there. So let's look at those two equations here. And we'll set up the first one with an electric field. We will start with an electric field in space. We're going to go around here a loop and worry about a magnetic flux through the center, the changing magnetic flux. So here's our loop. We'll pick the electric field to be simplified in the x direction. And here I have the z axis. So I have e of z and e of z plus delta z where I'm pointing upward. Notice that my coordinate system is right handed where if I take the i cross the j, I get k hat. And that's an acceptable way of orienting these three unit vectors. So when we do this loop integral, we're going to go here counterclockwise since that would be setting up in the positive direction for the little area that comes out of this plane, which would be along the y axis. So to be consistent, we'll do that. And to do our integral, we just simply have two sides here that work since this would be a pointing upward this electric field perpendicular to going across the top there. So we simply have E of Z plus delta Z times the delta X minus E of Z because we're going against it times delta X. And according to the equation, we need to have that be minus, that's the Lenz's law, times the derivative of the magnetic flux. So the magnetic flux would be the B field that points outward here times delta z times delta x. So delta z times delta x and then times b. And the derivative here will work on the b field and that'll give us the area with the minus sign in front, the db dt. So if we write all this together, set them equal, we have what's on the left that looks almost like a derivative, a partial derivative. And then on the right, it looks like we have the necessary ingredients to make this work. The delta x will kill the delta x's here and dividing by the delta z will give us the partial derivative. Now the notation here is a little bit cavalier. I am writing here as if the limits are taken and here I haven't taken the limit as delta z go to zero. I think it's easier to see it in this more friendly notation where I'm going to point out that I assume that we're going to take the limit as delta z go to zero, but I just don't want to write LIM delta z going to zero all the time. So I want the physics to be more transparent. So doing that, that's going to be the partial derivative with respect to z working on the electric uh, field. And that's my equation. Now this second equation, this is interesting because now what's happening is that remember my magnetic field, which I generated by this other equation above there, that's pointing along the y axis. And here is B of Z and then B of Z plus delta Z. And then this equation says we're going to get something that's going to be an electric flux, see, with this area. And I set this E going up because I'm taking the normal to be upward here and like I did before and before we had the lenses law we hadn't had to put a minus sign in but here we don't have the minus sign so we're all set ready to go and when we do this loop we have the b z here we're going here counterclockwise so b z lines up with delta y and then we fight the b z plus delta z going the opposite way so that's the minus sign delta y and that's equal to then the change of the 
E flux here, which is E times your delta Y delta Z, and the derivative operates on the E. And here you see uh, we have something that is starting to look like a derivative with respect to Z, and you're going to get that because the Y is going to cancel, the delta Y cancels, the delta Z is going to survive down there. Everything looks really good, and we need a minus sign because to flip this the other way to get the definition of the derivative in terms of calculus, we want the delta one first, so that minus sign has to be introduced to flip that to get the cancellation effect so to be equal to that. And then when we do that, we have minus the partial of b at respect to z is equal to the constants times the partial of e at respect to t. What do we have so far? These two nice equations. Well, what do we do now? Well, we have the derivative respect to z here, and it's the e and the b, but the derivative of the b with respect to t is c, the derivative of e with respect to z. How about if we take another derivative with respect to z? Uh, you know, one reason might be because you know the wave equation's got second derivatives, and you're trying to find something here that satisfies a wave. So, you know, at this time, you might say we're playing around with equations. And that's how physicists discover things, by playing with equations. But since we're kind of after a wave equation, and we know the wave equation has second derivative, it kind of leads us to play in that direction. So if we do that and take the second derivative of e with respect to z, we come in here and work on that term, get the second derivative with respect to z. And when we do that, we know that the second derivative with respect to z on that b, we already know that, so over here, so when we come in here and take this with respect to z, we then flip the order of the derivatives here. And when we do that, we can substitute this partial in for here. And guess what's going to happen there? Bingo. Second derivative with respect to time. That's going to be nice because the second derivative of e with respect to z. And then the second derivative of e, when you do that substitution here with respect to time, that is a wave equation, minus signs cancel out, and remember that one over v squared is here. Our dimensions have to work out, and that means the v is one over the square root of those constants, and that's the speed of light that we've already talked about before coming out that way. And we're seeing here we've derived the wave equation for the electric field, and for a practice problem, I'm asking you to do the similar thing for the magnetic field. And then we'll look at this in the next chapter more carefully. And in vector form, which is very powerful, it'll give us the directions. And we're going to find here, well, we kind of already found that out here. If the wave has that derivative with respect to z, you're traveling along the z direction. The electric field is perpendicular to the direction of motion as a transverse wave. And the magnetic field, which points out, is also here perpendicular, so you have a doubly transverse wave. And we'll, we'll go into that more carefully later. One final important observation here is that when we look at this wave equation that we derived, where we had z here, but I wanted to just simply emphasize that when you have a wave equation with the speed of light, something marvelous happens. And that's what we have up here. We have a wave equation where our v is the speed of light. So when you have that kind of situation going on, then what you see is that you have something that's in agreement with special relativity. Because you subtract here on one side, to get on one side the equation, everything. Notice that the derivative with the time variable, the second derivative, has the c with it, as you expect in special relativity. And the relative minus sign, when you have space and time, space over here and time over there, the relative minus sign, that means that this equation has relativity built in. Now, that, that's really amazing when you think about it because we derive the wave equation from scratch with some arbitrary uh, function, wave distortion traveling to the right and to the left. And then if you put in the speed of light, you automatically get what we would say is covariant, relativistically invariant. That's another way, a fancy way of saying that if you do a Lorentz transformation, you get the same kind of an equation. 
uh, if you put the primes on there, except you know the C will be the same, you get the same form. And for a homework problem, I'll be asking you to prove that. A very, very marvelous result where relativity is kind of staring you in the face, but it still took Einstein to figure out the meaning and the postulates and develop the special theory of relativity.